attendees to file in. Hey, Ari, Jeff Saffron, how are you? Wonderful. I will, we'll wait for uh, some more friends to, to file in and then, and then we'll, we'll begin. I guess let's, we'll start and people can catch up. So hello and welcome to this installment of Journeys in Jewish Studies with you Chicago alumni. My name is Josh Levitt. Since we are in the midst of the Passover holiday that recounts the ancient Hebrews exodus from Egypt to Eretz Yisrael, the land of Israel, let me begin this session with the opening lines of a children's poem simply titled Passover. It's a far, far road from Egypt to our own, our happy land. From the pyramids of Egypt built beneath the tyrant's hands, it's road so strange and marvelous that few can understand. Written around 1920 by Jesse Ethel Samter, this poem is familiar to our featured speaker today, Professor Sarah Imhoff. Sarah is a critical theorist, educator, and author, author most recently of The Lies of Jesse Samter, Queer, Disabled, Zionist. She received her master's and doctorate degrees at the University of Chicago Divinity School and presently serves as the Jewish Studies Chair at Indiana University Bloomington. Now, uh, the Jewish Studies program at IU has a U Chicago history, uh, established as it was in part by Maroon mathematician and historian Claude Jacquet. Uh, Sarah is here to tell us about her scholarship at the helm of the program today. As our conversation unfolds, please feel free to type your questions and comments in the chat. Some of you have submitted questions in advance and we'll try to cover as many as possible. Shalom and Tadar Rabah, Sarah. So, uh, I, yeah, of course, uh, we really appreciate your uh, making the time for this uh, lunchtime learning. Uh, well, I begin at the beginning. Uh, how would you say the University of Chicago figured in your career? Uh, tell us about your Chicago experience and how it shaped your own arc. Yeah, um, so I did both my MA and PhD at the Divinity School, and I would say that Chicago is where I learned how to be a scholar. I had a great undergraduate experience, but graduate school was where I learned what the business of being a scholar was like and what the intellectual life of being a scholar was. Um, and that was really positive, although sometimes hard. Um, I learned to ask critical questions, but only after I really thought I understood what the text said, not the kind of easy, oh, but what about this thing before I really felt like I understood what was going on. Um, I learned the satisfaction of reading a text, like a hard text <laughs> closely to figure out what's going on, um, to understand something about the world that didn't previously make sense or to understand someone's ideas about the world and say, oh, that's, a really fascinating way of looking at it. I don't know that I agree that that's the way it is, but to spend the time with someone else's thought, figuring out what the world looks like, how it works for them. Um, I know that a lot of people think of U of C as a really competitive place, uh, one where students feel like they have to outdo one another, like, oh, I'm busier than you, I'm more overworked than you, this is more horrible for me. <laughs> um, but my grad school experience was actually a very supportive one. That's not to say that it wasn't hard and we didn't complain about it, but um, I read with other grad students. We had writing groups. We critiqued each other's writing. And I don't mean just said nasty things about it. I mean, we shared stuff <laughs> we were working on and, um, and really valued each other's insights. Um, I remember studying French and German to, you know, to be able to read those languages. I still can't speak either one, but I can read them. Um, and again, with fellow graduate students and the sense that um, we weren't totally sure what we were doing there, but it was a requirement and it felt like we were 
in it together, this intellectual project. Um, some of these people are still my friends and colleagues, uh, and I still learn from them. So Larissa Resnick was a good friend of mine. She's teaching at UFC now. Um, she was just here a couple of weeks ago at, at, at IU at a workshop about uh, women Jewish thinkers. Um, Cooper Harris and I co-founded a journal called American Religion. So we work together all the time. Um, just in the past year or two, I've worked on collaborative projects with Carlos Manrique and Spencer Dew and Heather Miller Rubens, all of whom were graduate students at Chicago when I was. So the idea that um, students must be competitive with one another, I think doesn't have to be so, um, and, and wasn't my experience at Chicago, which is not to say I didn't see it happen, but it is to say that I think um, it can, that Chicago can be a really supportive and generative intellectual environment, um, and it doesn't always have to live up to the, gosh, my, my life is harder than your life. <laughs> um, I stayed up later than you did working on this kind of thing. Um, another thing I've really come to appreciate as the years have gone on um, is the way that Chicago encouraged me to cultivate an academic approach that was my own approach. Mm. So there was never any pressure or even the suggestion that I should grow up to be like my advisor. A lot of places sort of have that, um, you know, mentor disciple kind of model where you go to study with someone and then you become just like them intellectually, obviously not just like them, but in some way you're expected to follow in someone's footsteps. And one of the things that I loved about Chicago was that there wasn't that sense. Um, I, in my case, I wrote a dissertation about um, Jewish gender in the US and I wrote it with Clark Gilpin, who was my advisor. And he's a, he works on intellectual and religious history of the US, but much more from a Protestant lens. Um, my dissertation committee members were involved in Jewish studies in various ways, but none of them was an American Jewish historian. Um, so Lior Auslander was also on my committee and she was um, and is uh, a wonderful historian, but her research is mainly on Europe. Um, and so it wasn't, there was no sense that I should model my own thoughts or questions or methods on exactly one other person, but rather that I could and should learn from all of these different people. Um, I think that shows up in the way that I think about who I'm writing for, um, what scholarly conversations I want to be a part of. Uh, there can be a, there can be a way sometimes that Jewish studies scholarship assumes that we already know this is important or interesting because it's about Jews and Judaism, right? And I've never done my research with that assumption. I'm always asking the question, why might this matter to somebody who isn't particularly interested in Jews or Jewish history or Jewishness? Um, what does this tell us about, yes, Jews and Judaism, but does it also tell us something about the world beyond? Does it tell us something about how religion is working, about how peoplehood or race or nationality or any of those kinds of things? Um, yeah, so I think that's really, if I were thinking about how has Chicago continued to be a part of my career, that's a, that's a major facet of it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, um, that, that description, because you're right that sometimes uh, studies in this field can feel like, like a havruta, like, like just like a small group of people studying together and they already like already have that buy-in and they're speaking to each other about it uh but but the more like cross-disciplinary like exchange of ideas has like translated from your your studies here to like to your scholarship and your and your approach to it um i appreciate that description yeah 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 and i think um that that sometimes over to dynamic where like we're talking to the same people yeah. um is is a bit of a shame because i think often those same pieces of scholarship 
had they been framed differently or been in conversation with something else, do have things to contribute to scholarship beyond Jewish study. So um, I don't think that it's true that Jewish study scholarship is necessarily or even usually um, a, a kind of insular activity or doesn't need to be. I think that a lot of the questions that people are asking, even when they even when they talk about them in an insular way, could actually be really interesting to people beyond. Yeah. And, and and maybe that's you know maybe that's true in like certain academic fields, you know probably. <laughs> For <laughs> Although, <sure. laughs> even as you know we're seeing now, I think more, um, or maybe a resurgence of you know the the public intellectual who can like speak across audiences and and so on. I mean. I hope so. I would love intelligent public discourse, I feel like. Can we all? Yeah. <laughs> more, more of that, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what if we all? Um, no, I appreciate that. So it's fun to think that actually, like you and I were on campus at the same time, but following different paths. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, I taught in the human being and the citizen. Um, as a graduate student. So I, you know, and, and I teed um, another couple of religious studies classes. So I saw a few undergraduate students, I have to say Chicago undergraduate students, I'm sure they're still great, but at the time were really a pleasure to teach. Um, it's, there is nothing so wonderful as teaching a classroom full of nerds who are like, we just wanna learn. Like we're interested in learning because learning is fun and we wanna know things we didn't know. And um, yeah. So uh, it was, I'm, I didn't have you as a student, but I certainly had some of your peers and it was uh, delightful. Yeah, I, I appreciate it, of course, appreciate that. Uh, so so I guess, you know, maybe this is good uh, launching off point, you know, in terms of your approach to scholarship, um, you know, your book that came out last year, The Lives of Jesse Semter. Uh, what is that book about? Um, what were the lives of Jesse Semter? Yeah, um, so that book is about a woman who was born in 1883 in the US and died in 1938 in Palestine. And I found Jessie Samter in the archives. I knew that she had existed, a couple of people had quoted her here and there, but there wasn't much written about her. And uh, I was totally captivated by her. And here's why. For me, she was this fascinating intellectual puzzle. She grew up in an ethical culture family in the US. They had a Christmas tree um, and she turned to Zionism as an adult and then turned, um, then turned to Judaism or added Judaism to kind of part of how she's thinking about the world. Um, and she moved to Palestine. She's also really fascinating because she becomes this outspoken Zionist, which we wouldn't expect for somebody of her kind of cultural background, but she also had polio as a child, which meant that she, um, she didn't, she wasn't in an iron lung and she didn't use a wheelchair, but she definitely had um, lasting effects that meant that exhaustion, inability to walk very far, um, sometimes inability to use her hands for long periods of time and pain were part of her life for the rest of her life. We, she also didn't ever marry. Um, and she lived part of her life and made financial decisions, including moving onto a kibbutz with a woman named Leah Berlin, who was a Russian Zionist who had also moved to Palestine. So she was such a puzzle to me because Zionism at the time was very invested in the muscular, able-bodied Jew who is going to work the land. Um, and also we can see it's less so than it becomes later, but also this pronatalist idea that you should like marry and have children and raise them. And she, her life was not doing those things. <laughs> she was not going to be able to plow fields. Um, and she knew that. And so I wondered, um, what do we make of this really articulate woman 
who wrote a bunch of stuff. She wrote poetry, she wrote essays, she wrote for kids, she wrote for adults, she wrote educational materials, she wrote like prose poetry, um, she wrote in English and in Hebrew, and she's thoughtful about the world around her. So what, what was it that made her lead this life? What was it that made her turn to Zionism, even though it wasn't at all a good match for her own embodied life? And that's, that's the puzzle of the book. Um, the book <laughs> itself <laughs> is, um, is biographical, as you can tell from my description, but it's a kind of weird biography in that it's not chronological. So um, the first chapter is about thinking about her life as a religious life. And the second chapter is as a disabled life. And the third chapter is as a queer life. So you can see that there's this, um, yeah, this maybe tension in the pieces of her lives. Um, but also I think that we could probably tell most people's stories that way. Um, we could probably say that most people have threads that go throughout their lives that maybe don't always fully fit. Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe they don't always fully fit or they seem not to fit, but perhaps they do, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so one of the things that I have come to think as I've thought with Center for a long time is that very few of us have embodied lives that seamlessly match up with our ideological or political descriptions of the world or even commitments. And, um, and she seems to be a, a pretty prominent case of that. Uh, right. But I also think that ways that she did sometimes try to make them fit. Like she offers critiques of Zionism. She offers alternative visions of Zionism. Sometimes she doesn't even say this is an alternative vision of Zionism. Sometimes she says, this is the vision of Zionism. And it includes deaf children. <laughs> and it includes, um, so she adopted a Yemenite toddler. And so she was really interested in, even before that, she had been really interested in Yemenite education of Yemenite Jews um, because they were often not socially integrated. And so even in places where there should have been education um, for them there it was like oh nope just Ashkenazi only here um so she was really invested in thinking about a Zionism that wasn't just an Ashkenazi Zionism interesting interesting um and of course this is a you know this is a formative period before you know the formal like the modern establishment of the state so it seemed like yeah. it was also a little moment for for that sort of for that sort of thinking after Theodore Herzl but before establishing the state yeah, I think that's a real value for people who don't think much about Jewish history. Um, I would say once there is a state of Israel, what Zionism can be really gets foreclosed. It's like, okay, now Zionism is just this one thing. It basically looks like support for the state of Israel as it is. Before that happens, there are multiple visions of Zionism. Samter has one, but there are lots. Um, right. And because it because it is not a Jewish state yet, and also because it's British mandate, they can critique the British and say they're doing it wrong and it should be like this. And when we, you know, in the future, I mean, Sandra was a binationalist, um, but she spends very little time talking about the state. She mm -hmm. spends um, much more of her time imagining a future Jewish society. Uh, which of course we can say, yeah, those things are really connected, but she's interested in the like the culture and the society part. Um, and you can see that she's not in agreement with everyone around her, but you're right, a lot is up for grabs. Um, and it's not, it is stuff like infrastructure, but it's also stuff like, how do we imagine education? How do we think about the role of women? Um, how do we think about what it means to bring Jews from a bunch of culturally really different places and put them all together? How do we think yeah. about Arab Jews or Mizrahi Jews, although there isn't really the category of Mizrahi then, it's more like these Jews are from Yemen and these Jews are from Morocco and these Jews are yeah. from Tunisia. So yeah, there's a lot that 
it's easy to take for granted from our historical perspective that was not at all um, taken for granted then. And in fact, sometimes things that won out in, in the long arc of history were not even particularly prominent at the time. Right, especially because we're talking about a period where um, where actually like the, the geographical location is not necessarily taken for granted. You know, you mentioned at, you know, at this time, this is, you know, the British mandate of Palestine, but we also have the decades preceding, you know, the British Uganda program that was going <laughs> to set up a, a Jewish society in, in Uganda. There was also uh, supposed plans for Madagascar, for location in Japan, for, <laughs> uh, yeah. and go back a century earlier to, uh, like, New York, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, um, so also like there seems to be, I think an important, or I guess maybe it's more of a question to what extent was there an important distinction for her between like the concept and location? So she was a Zionist for whom Palestine did matter. Um, she's in conversation with people as you suggest for whom Palestine does not matter. They're like, we just need a safe space for Jews to create their own society. Um, she's a person who thinks that there is uh, an importance in Jewish history of the particular land of Palestine. Um, but like I said, she's less invested in the idea of a state, right? Some other people are like, we really need a state, but it doesn't matter where the state is. And other people were like, oh, we really need to be in Palestine, but it matters less what, you know, if it's a state or not. She's more like that second one. Um, so yeah. she, yeah. So she does think um, that, that there's something not that there's something like special and better about Palestine, but that there is something special and distinctive to Jews and Jewish history about the land. Um, so it's uh, so she doesn't spend a lot of time calling it the Holy Land, for example, which implies that it's like for, but that the Jews have a history with this land. Um, and, and for her, I mean, being a binationalist, it's not so much an exclusivist history, but she would compare it to like, well, Irish nationalism, the Irish really care about Ireland because that's where their culture and history roots them. And so we Jews, this is where our history roots us, which is not to say that it's like, you know, the best and therefore belongs to us, but just that that's um, something, you know, something about um, history and culture ties Jews to this space. Yeah, I, and I feel like, that may be what uh, Samter alludes to in that um, in, in that Passover poem that I opened with um, when she writes uh, that the road um, to to the land, you know, to Eretz Israel, um, that road is so strange and marvelous that few can understand. Like, what do you think she meant? What do you think she meant by that? Um, I think she's thinking in a couple of ways. One, that Jewish history is long and does not follow a sort of straight line, right? Some people would tell the story of Jewish history like, oh, it's just been persecution all the way down. Um, and she's not that narrative, right? Yes, she recognizes persecution, but she also says, yeah, but Jews have also thrived in places. We see Jewish culture um, in places even where Jews are, you know, economically disadvantaged or politically disadvantaged or things like that. Um, she also has a little bit of a mystical streak sometimes. And uh, I think some of that may also be that um, there are, maybe that there are sometimes processes at work that we can't see as they're happening um, and that human perception doesn't always get everything there is to get or everything there might be in the world right. to understand. Um, even though she's also very much a naturalist and is like, we should look at the birds and the trees because those tell us something really profound about the world. So she does think that, it's not that she thinks that humans really can't understand the world, um, but that, that your average human doesn't fully understand it. And then add to that, 
if we're trying to think about a long history, um, that there's that there may be other things going on. Yeah, it's I that was def definitely the sense that I got, um, and that it's um, really like lines like that speak really in multiple valences, both like with like with respect to her intellectual ideological projects, um, but then also even like our our and perhaps you know uh, like our relationship and non-Jews really like relationship or understanding to Jewish history in and of itself or histories plural however uh, you know yeah so so that's interesting but I, I want to actually uh, put a little pressure on um, your, your your framing about about how those lines uh, how those lines and those poems um, perhaps challenge a narrative of uh, disadvantage, she said. But I, I know in her 1915 book, uh, Course on Zionism, yeah. uh, Samter frames the status of the Jews as an ethno-religious group and as a national people under repressive regimes throughout the diaspora in terms of disabilities rather than disadvantages. Right? So she outlines mm -hmm. In uh, syllabus one, <laughs> for instance, uh, civil disabilities, educational disabilities, social disabilities based in anti-Semitism, these are all uh, her words, um, and how, as she writes, um, emancipation causes Jews to attempt assimilation in hope of overcoming other disabilities. So I just wondered, like, how do you see her thinking about disability like as a framework for for political history and future you know yes so a couple of things one is I think it's really helpful it's what you point out is absolutely right there is the that course on Zionism which is designed to be like a bit of a reader for an American Jewish audience um mm -hmm does talk about disabilities. Of course, she wouldn't use disability in that way to describe, say, physical disability. Um, but I do think you're right to say that she seems to be pretty invested in like, oh, here are the things that have been hard for Jews. Here are the ways that Jews have been oppressed. I think it's helpful to remember that she's writing for a US Jewish audience. And if you look carefully, there's not a lot about Jews being oppressed in the US. Um, so she's trying to remind U.S. Jews, that Jews in other places um, are suffering, because that's one of the most compelling arguments to get American Jews on board with Zionism. Very few American Jews actually want to move to Palestine. This is another reason that she's pretty unusual. Um, and so the idea to get them behind Zionism is basically financially supporting being outspoken in this way. And one of the strongest arguments, um, one of the arguments that makes the most impact is to say, oh, look, Jews have been suffering and these Jews in these other places still are suffering, right? So there's a little bit of that, um, yeah, we could say propaganda. I think it's reasonable, like the Hadassah talks about propaganda, not in that kind of negative way that we have now, but the like convincing people yeah, of your position. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The persuasion. <laughs> yeah. So I do think we want to read that a little bit in terms of that persuasion. Um, but I also think that you're right. We would we would be mistaken to say, oh, she just has a rosy picture of Jewish history, or she thinks that Jews have never been persecuted. Um, and she, I would say this time period in her life is the one where she, kind of the only one where she's really concerned about assimilation. Um, mm -hmm. She wrote a, a pamphlet about Hanukkah and how Jews should celebrate Hanukkah and not Christmas, um, which is, yeah, which yeah, sounds funny. There. Yeah, yeah. Uh, considering like how probably like, like Hanukkah has become for like American Jews, even though it is not really a major holiday. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and I think we all know that's because of Christmas. Um, right. Yeah, Diane Ashton, I think, has a, a good, good like history of Hanukkah yeah. book. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Um, yeah, and so Samter, I think she'd be thrilled to know that Jews picked up on Hanukkah. I mean, she also, I think, um, her Judaism was not necessarily orthodox either in the like smaller or the big O sense. So I think that she would have said, if that's a meaningful way for Jews to celebrate their Judaism, then they should do it, right? It is like, it thinks about Jewish history that she thinks is really crucial. Um, and so while there are certainly other people, <laughs> right, who can, who can be cynical about it, I think she would be like, yeah, well, like that, that fits in culturally. It's not, um, of course. it's, yeah, it's not in, in a way it's responsive to culture, but it's not assimilating it fully into that culture. It's long, yeah, predates. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think, yes. So all of that to say that I think you're right to point to her ideas about disability or, um, you know, civic disability or economic disability um, as important. And a, a lot of that syllabus, um, the course on Zionism, is about learning the ways that Jews have suffered throughout history. But that's not its only point. Um, I think, I mean, I think there's also a threading, you kind of have to thread the needle there or like, um, you, you don't wanna end up too far in the, wow, Jews have always been oppressed because then it's not compelling to say, and we are a strong people who can, you know, resurrect our society or rebuild our society, right? If it's just like a whole history of like how terrible everything has always been, then it, like, is there that core that she would think of, of culture to, you know, tend right. to that would bloom again, right? So yes, I think there is definitely that strong sense of, um, yeah, suffering, but also a sense of um, the strength and, and um, distinctiveness of Jewish culture that helps keep the Jewish people a people even through all that suffering for her. Yeah, exactly. And then, I mean, I also like point to that, I think, because of the ways that um, our like theorizing or like critical thinking around like disability and so on um, has there where there's a continuity over time and change time in like the use of that word and that um, yeah. and just like the concept of ability and disability and so on. It's obviously very like important to you and how how you would like us to think about. Uh, about Jesse Samter, about her intellectual, cultural contributions, and so on. So I think that it's also helpful, like, for you to make that distinction of how she's using the term, and also how, like, we might be using the term in, in critical discourse today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when she talks about her own disabilities, she will sometimes refer to herself as crippled um, or a semi-invalid. I'm. We generally don't use these words, although some of the disability community has reclaimed crip as its own kind of, um, <laughs> yeah, as its own kind of critical discourse. Um, but I, the one thing that I think is useful to think about the continuities between the two kinds of disability is the way that we would all assume that civic disability or economic disability or things like that are created by the world you live in. Right, it's not something that's inherent or essential to your own being, um, and that can be a helpful way to rethink things like physical disability. To say, oh yeah, this physical disability is really a disability because of the world that I live in. Like we don't think needing eyeglasses is a disability because eyeglasses, because eyeglasses. yeah. Right, because yeah. we have access to eyeglasses because lots of people use eyeglasses. Um, whereas you might imagine um, instances where it might feel like a disability. Um, I don't know if you're stranded on a desert island and have to like sew something, I'm not sure. But, <laughs> but I think that's a great example in part because it's hard to imagine like, oh, because the world we live in, it's so regular to wear contacts for. Um, and we might also think about like, oh, it's not so disabling if you can't walk long distances if like you live in the suburbs. But if you lived in a village where you need to walk to get water, then that really is disabling. Um, I mean, you right. can see this in Samter's life too, where after she moves to Palestine, life there in some ways is more disabling. There's like less infrastructure than there was in New York. <laughs> um, 
And so I think that kind of, even though we might initially say like, oh, that looks like discontinuity, but that kind of continuity for saying, oh yeah, these structures can be things that are disabling rather than kind of having imagining disabilities inherent to a body or a person. Right. And I think that, I think that's why it's helpful, like the way that, you know, you, I have like interjected or, you know, introduced with um, disadvantaged or perhaps we could say disenfranchised or just, you know, and, and in that way to be like disabled as in like the ability has been removed. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Or has exactly. Or not been added or supported. You right. Know? Yeah, you're right. I think that that really does emphasize the the idea that this isn't something um, foundational to the person, but rather is about the interaction between the structure and the person. And that structure might be an economic one or a physical one or lots of other social ones. Yeah. So, so what does um, what does your syllabus look like? How do you bring these together when when working with uh, you know college students, graduate students at IU and yeah, so I've actually never taught Jesse Snafter to my students, which is, um, uh, I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> <That's exciting>. I, <laughs> yeah, I uh, often teach um, a pretty big introductory class called Jews, Christians, Muslims that I love, um, but that one I teach is a relatively presentist U.S. class because it's for people who are never going to take another religious studies class, and that seems like um, an effective and interesting way to get them to ask good critical questions about religion and the world around them. Um, if I were, or when I when I do um, teach some about disability, so I've taught the graduate students about disability. Um, one of the things that I find really valuable is to read first person narratives of disability. There there are quite a few really good ones out there and they're so distinctively different. Um, There's sometimes, you know, like over time they can be different, uh, but also thinking about how people um, talk about religion and disability is really interesting to me and has not been written about very much. Um, In a lot of disability studies, religion either doesn't come up or seems kind of, I don't know, epiphenomenal. Um, But when we read memoirs of people with disability, there, we often see like significant engagement with religion, either in its formal senses or in um, kind of just personal theologizing, like theodicy, what does it mean that I'm in pain all the time? How? How could the world be like this? Would would right. a God really want this? Yeah. Why me? <laughs> yes. Yes. Why me? <laughs> <laughs> you know. Uh, you know. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know, how, how can this happen? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I I hear you on that. I mean, you and I just want to you know, uh, looking you know at the you know next twenty minutes or so you know just to thank you for giving us so much uh, to think about. I want to turn to some uh, questions that have been submitted uh, beforehand, so on. Um, one has to do more, um, I guess is a, a, a ha, yeah, ha, dovetails with with what, you know, we've been talking about your own uh, scholarship and teaching. Uh, your, your first book is Masculinity in the Making of American Judaism. Uh, basically, you ask, you know, how did American Jewish men experience manhood? How did they present their masculinity to others? And how, in the early 20th century, uh, Jews constructed, as you write, like, a, a gentler, less aggressive manhood, perhaps also, you know, more like intellectual manhood that's drawn partly from American pioneer spirit and immigration experience, but, you know, also from, you know, or perhaps in counterpoint to, um, you know, the Hollywood and YMCA, which, you know, as, as you say, like, you know, required intense cultivation of that, like, muscled male physique and so on. Um, how do you see, um, how do you see your, you know, what was it like to write a second book? And do you see the second book on Jesse Samter being, like, of a piece with uh, masculinity in the making of American Judaism or something of a divergence, a little bit of both? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
it's certainly a little bit different. I did, I did discover Samter's, the extent of Samter's papers in the archives when I was looking for um, material for my first book, because as you can imagine, if you're writing a book about men and masculinity, like you have a lot of men talking about men all the time. And I wondered what, what are some American Zionist women saying about men or masculinity? And Samter doesn't actually spend a lot of time talking about men and masculinity. Um, Henry is old every once in a while does, but um, yeah, but I became fascinated by Samter. I was like, oh, I'll write an article about her. And then I just kept reading and there was so much there and she was so interesting. And I'm going to write a whole book. Um, so in some like superficial ways, the books are about the same time period ish. They're about the construction of gender and Judaism, um, and thinking about how Jews might do gender in ways that are similar to and slightly different from the other mostly white folks around them. Um, but in other ways, the lives of Jesse Sampter is really different. Methodologically, it's different. It's, uh, the, I spend some time in the book. So I would say I'm a character in the book. Um, I spend some time in the book thinking about my own embodied experience and what embodied experience can teach us. So I, Sampter was an avid gardener. So I grew or tried to grow the things that she was growing. Um, she used to cut silhouettes out of paper. Um, that's really hard. I've tried it and my silhouettes look like amoebas rather than um, human heads. <laughs> We're still developing the high fine motor skills, I hear you. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I went, I tried to go the places that she went. I um, went to the places she had lived. I spent a little time on the kibbutz where she lived um, and walked the places that she walked and spent a lot of time thinking about how we know what we know through the body. So in some ways, the book is pretty standard in that it takes a lot of her written work and others written work about her as major primary sources. But I also wanted to ask the question, um, are there things that scholars can know through embodied ways that are maybe different from um, or complementary to some of the things we can know through written sources. And so that some of that question animates the book. Um, and along with that question is, how much of my embodied experience can I assume is shared with yours? Or can I assume is shared with somebody who lived 100 years ago? Or can I assume is shared with somebody who um, experienced difficulty walking, right? Um, and I don't have complete answers to those questions, but I can say, that approaching the book with that methodology made me ask some different questions, even of the textual material. So in this way, the second book is quite different from the first one, which was really about textual materials. Um, it was less about material objects or media, even though a little bit about that, but not much. Um, and this second book really, I wanted to think about that question of embodiment. And that came out of the sources, that came out of Samter's writing. Um, I thought she talks, she writes about being in pain. She writes to her sister about how she feels physically and how that matters to her daily life and what she's doing and what her goals are and what her plans are. And so I wanted to know, hmm, and also because her life, because I was interested in this question of what do we make of her life beside her Zionism? How are they fitting together? Um, the questions of what do we know through our bodies? What are our embodied experiences? And do scholars have any access to someone else's embodied experience? These were questions that um, animated the second book that did not in the first book at all. Right, and, and it sounds like uh, I guess that like, like as pointed to me, like it, that tracks as you like move, like kind of like zoomed in on a central figure, and then perhaps like correspondingly, it sounds like you like adopted a almost a method acting approach <laughs> to to the scholarship yeah. <laughs> along with the critical analysis, you know. 
Uh, yeah. So that's interesting. Uh, one question uh, that comes in is, uh, what was the most surprising or unexpected response to your work on on Samter uh, that you did not anticipate? And you know, what what did that feedback say, and how did you respond and feel? Um. Good question. I think that it wasn't totally shocking, but um, mm -hmm. a couple of people have sent me nasty emails saying, how can you say that she's a lesbian? And oh. right. Um, and my answer is, actually, I never said that she was a lesbian. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I'm really invested in not saying that she wouldn't have labeled herself that way. I do think it makes sense to think of her as living a queer life. So in the book, I talk about queer kinship. Um, it's clear that she and Leah Berlin make big decisions together. Leah Berlin is um, certainly cares for Tamar, who is um, Jesse's adopted daughter. The three of them move on to the kibbutz together. Um, this is not a heteronormative life. And that was important to me to be able to say that. But I think that some people were then um, it just felt like, no, you like don't call her a lesbian. I don't know. I didn't correspond with either of these people. They were both actually that's not true. I did respond to one of them and say <laughs> and say, um, uh, actually, I deal with it, some of this in the text. I hope you read it. And then right. the <laughs> and the other one was nasty enough that I didn't. Um, but yeah. but I. Um, I, I suppose I do wonder what is it that is that would be upsetting for those readers. Um, is it that she is it that they know something about Samter and think she wasn't a lesbian? Possible. Um, is it that they're uh, concerned that early Zionist figures should fit a heteronormative? frame i don't know um but yeah that's a, that was a a reaction I, I wasn't i guess i'm a little surprised um the vehemence of that reaction in part because i don't i didn't think that my audience was going to be a lot of people who were going to um, yeah i guess worry do, you about think, that. do you think maybe the concern was some sort of uh practice shoehorning of her into a like into a category that as you said like she like would not have have really been in her like frame of thinking yeah I mean that is a concern that's certainly a concern I had like I was like I don't I don't want to call her a lesbian a because I don't know if she had sex with anyone ever um she didn't write about that so I don't know um but to me that was not the interesting part the interesting part was how does she put her life together who are the important people in her life how did she make her decisions um and um she also expressed interest in men during her life also so yet another reason why I was like mm, lesbian is a particular label um that I don't think fits historically now queer right. is also a label that fit historically which is why i'm careful not to call her a queer person um i think of queer as oh it's an analytical lens we can look at her life and or we can look at her writing and say that she expresses queer desire um like desire to be a boy desire to um marry a woman things like that um so i think it's fair to say if we're thinking about queerness as a kind of non-heteronormative, anti-heteronormative, that there are these elements there um, without labeling her identity, because that part, I think, is historically inaccurate um, to say. It would be a mistake to say that she identified as a queer person okay. without that word or something like that. Um, we can take, yeah. take her as a descriptor or, you know, to, to capture, as you're saying, like, you know, for you know, I, perhaps, you know, uh, for all intents and purposes that she had this partnership, you know, that uh, she had this partnership with Leah Berlin that, you know, perhaps maybe some, you know, romantic, not romantic, you know, so on, um, perhaps some permutation of Naomi and Ruth, you know, who knows, yeah. but like, <laughs> you know, but, um, but all the same as a way to describe 
the historic her as much as possible her lived reality rather than necessarily like using her as a figure for like contemporary discourse or something you know yeah 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 Yeah. i mean i do i do think it's interesting i mean i i have wondered there are a couple of other people now who have expressed interest in her and i do wonder what um others will say as they write about her yeah i mean and i get and that's that's the dream right that you know the scholarship that you produce hopefully inspires people to learn more you know including yeah. you know including those things that necessarily you couldn't include in the book because there's only so much that yeah. you can do in one study um yeah. which brings uh to um another question that has uh, come in is that like like were there any interesting facts details pieces of evidence regarding center that you cannot include in the book due to time space constraints and uh what, what what would you say is uh you know the the deleted scene for us from the Bible? <laughs> um there are a whole bunch of little things i mean there are still little things that i am finding um i i wish that i had known a little more about leah berlin um and since then someone is writing a little bit more about her um so i that that's a thing that i wish i could have included but i that, that scholarship didn't exist at the time. And right. I didn't know the sources <laughs> yeah. were there. Um, but yeah, I that uh it's not quite a deleted scene, but I wish I wish that was a scene. <laughs> um, yeah. and um yeah, and there are other there are other bits and pieces like people have asked about Tamar, and I don't really know um Tamar Center grew up on the kibbutz and got married and had children. Um, but I don't um I didn't, I didn't make a study of her. Um, oh, so here's a really random fun thing. Okay. Uh, Sampter's niece uh -huh. um, was, who was named after her. So she's Jesse Wackenheim, was one of the first women pilots, licensed women pilots in the US, like flying Good. an airplane. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that is definitely a fun fact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, another a question um, that's come in is like, uh, do you have a sense of what um, Israelis today or perhaps from this period to today uh, think or have thought about Samter? Um, yeah, the answer is mostly they didn't think about Samter. Um, like Americans, mostly people weren't thinking about her. Um, but the scholar that I mentioned who's working on it, who's uh, working some on Samter and has um, found additional materials on Leah Berlin is Israeli. Um, and there's somebody else too, who's written a little bit about Samter. So my sense is, um, she's not, she's not widely known in the public sphere. Like there are no streets named after her. There are for her friend, Henrietta Sold, um, but there aren't for her. I think, uh, she, maybe fits into a slightly larger picture of people being interested in early, not even early, but women Zionists who were um, involved both intellectually and kind of uh, more socially in the, in Mandate Palestine. Um, she's certainly well remembered at her kibbutz. Um, well, and old. yes, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's not, it's, she wasn't 100% forgotten to history, but she also was not seen as a historical figure um, and, and therefore also certainly not controversial. Um, it'd be interesting, I'll be interested to hear about whether anybody thinks she's worth reclaiming in some way to um, say, think about disability in Israel. Um, it seems possible. It also seems possible that somebody writing 100 years ago is not, right? So I mentioned that she was invested in um, deaf education. Uh, and, and there, this is a great example. Um, she really thinks that deaf students should be educated using the latest methods. They're going to grow up and be Zionist citizens, right? Um, and that's not what lots of people think. Lots of people are like, actually, we should just keep them out. We like 
nope, what we, what we want are like able-bodied. I mean, there's certainly a bit of eugenics in many people's Zionism, but even Samter um, is a proponent of oralism, which is the idea that deaf people should read lips and speak rather than use sign language. So she's not like ripe for um, drawing upon if you want to make an argument about the placeness, the place of deaf culture in the in Israel or something and like that. Maybe, maybe to some extent, uh, you know, uh, eugenics. Some might say, "Oh, it's just pragmatic." It's <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but all the but problem but problematic all the same. <laughs> yeah. As, uh, as you're pointing out, um, you know, another question: uh, To what extent might uh, Semter say that the modern state has achieved, is not achieving some of you know some of her uh, ideals? Yeah. Great question. I think the answer is there are some things that she would be proud of and impressed with and glad that she participated with and some things that she would be disappointed in. Um, she was, uh, unlike some Zionists, she wrote specifically about how can Jews live beside Arabs. Um, and for her, the, the big bad guy was the British. <laughs> and the British managing of Palestine was, that was the problem. It was pitting um, non-Jewish Arabs against Jews and mostly Ashkenazi Jews. Um, and she recognized this was a problem and wanted to live side by side as brothers. She also um, is at times orientalist about, you know, Arabs are maybe less civilized or maybe backwards, but maybe they also are um, romantic in a way or like have beautiful clothes or whatever. Um, it, like maybe you can just from her upbringing in the States. No. I mean, yeah, and that kind of Orientalism is popular in Germany too. I mean, there, there's a widespread version of that kind of Orientalism where people from the East are like less civilized, but somehow romantic and um, appealing and maybe even maybe even sometimes like closer to God. She doesn't do that one. But um, so she has complicated ideas about and, and in this sense, I mean, in a good way, she recognizes the complexity, even if we might not always agree with her judgments um, about what it, what it will be like for different peoples to live together in this land. Um, yeah. It's hard. I mean, I think she would be really disappointed to see the way that that has turned out. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can, I can see that, um, and and and, and acknowledging, I, I think it, you know this is all part of the work of recuperating you know, recuperating her reputation, recuperating her, her poetry, her nonfiction, so on. Um, and, you know, this is, of course, a, that's a big, you know, intellectual project. Um, one of our questions, I think, also turns us back to your uh, embodied experience uh, or something like that. You know, what was the writing process like for you in putting your book together? Um, like, where do you, like, where do you go to do your best writing? Um, desk, couch, do you edit at the end as you go? Like, what is it, you know, what is it like? What are the, what are your biggest challenges? How do you circumvent them? You know, we have, uh, we have, uh, you know, our, our writers in the, in the Maroon community who want to know. What yes. <laughs> um, I write at my desk or on the couch, a little bit of each. Um, and I spend a lot of time writing um, and a lot of time editing. So this book, I did a lot of rewriting and editing. It was really important to me for this book to be accessible, uh, more so in than the first one. I mean, the first one had the time constraints of tenure clock and things like that. Um, but this one, in part also because I was writing about disability, I, it made me think a lot about accessibility, who has access to things. Um, and so I really wanted to write this in a way that non-academics could read and without making it less smart. So the book has all of the complicated ideas in it, 
but I spent a lot of time trying to write them in ways that would make sense to somebody, even if they hadn't read the theorist I was thinking with. Um, mm -hmm. And it, I, I always knew this, but it really drove home for me an appreciation of, of accessible writing because it takes more time. It is much faster to write an academic article um, that is kind of jargony and technical and makes its points and, and the end. Um, this took lots longer because it began in ways that were kind of technical. And then I had to say, okay, how do I think about presenting this idea to an audience that's a smart audience, but doesn't necessarily have the same background. Um, that was also really important because the different chapters um, engage different literatures. So the religious studies literature is not the same as the disability studies literature is not the same. And to assume that any reader had all of those was gonna be a really tall order too. So in that way, the accessibility made sense too. So yeah, this book I would say more so than the um, the first one, there was a lot of rewriting and editing as part of that process. But I think it's a fair point. The easier a text is to read, the harder it was to write. <laughs> uh, so I, I want to be mindful of your time and uh, that of our attendees. But of course, you know, uh, you Chicago Maroons respond well to a syllabus, and that seems to have been a structuring concept of our conversation anyway. Uh, what would you recommend? Uh, what would you recommend we read, watch, or listen to next uh, in the realm of uh, Jewish studies or beyond? Um, that's fun. I think if you're interested, if you were interested in this, you might really like Laura Liebman's Once We Were Slaves, which follows mainly two people um, in the Atlantic world, uh, but is a fascinating story of race and gender and Jewishness. Um, I won't give away all of the bits and pieces, but it too is beautifully written and accessible even if you are not well versed on say Caribbean Jewish history. So that seems like a good you know, related thing. I, I, I loved it, I think it's great. Sounds like a great recommendation. Um, I want to, you know, thank you again, Sarah, for making the time to speak with us. Uh, I want to thank you, Chicago Masters alumnus and New Books Network podcaster Ari Barbalot for ideating this series. Uh, I want to thank the team in U Chicago Alumni Engagement for providing this virtual venue. And of course, I want to thank you, the, you know, Maroon Mishpacha family for uh, tuning in and uh, being a part of our U Chicago community. Uh, when the session closes, you can not only share your experience today, but also suggest future topics. Uh, we do take your feedback to heart. We do read the comments. Um, then join us on May 2nd for a virtual lecture and social networking opportunity for you Chicago alumni in Israel, or used to be in Israel, or want to be in Israel. Um, economist and uh, fellow Maroon, um, Ayal um, Kimchi will describe socioeconomic challenges facing Israel today from retirement pensions to structural changes on family farms. Uh, and finally, you can find more opportunities to explore career journeys uh, with you Chicago Maroons at alumniandfriends.uchicago.edu. Uh, again, I'm Josh Levitt. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, please feel free to email me at jblevitt at uchicago.edu. Um Pesach Sameach for everyone celebrating Passover. Uh, may the you know the Yom Tovim, the holidays closing out the holiday, uh, be festive and reflective. Uh, take care, everyone. Thanks again, Sarah. Okay.